Okay, hi everybody. Um, this is Dan Barry, and welcome to our June MAP program webinar. We're going to be talking about drought, uh, the topic of drought today, and um, research efforts to better understand, monitor, and predict droughts. And um, just a little note, we have four speakers today, so this will go a little bit beyond three, probably to a quarter after or 20 after or so. Um, and very excited about the, the series of talks that we're going to hear. Hopefully we'll hit on all three of those topics that I mentioned just a moment ago. We're going to hear first from Marty Hurling, who's at the NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory, and he's going to talk a little bit about drought trends. Um, Tom Delworth from NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory is going to uh, touch on the global warming hiatus and how that is uh, related to North American drought. Um, Amir Agakuchek from the University of California at Irvine is going to talk a little bit about some prediction efforts that they've been working on, both statistically um, and dynamical approaches. And finally, John Nielsen Gammon is going to talk about some of the really um, uh, interesting hydrological experiences they've had in Texas over the last few years, going from severe drought now to flood conditions, um, and a little bit about monitoring and detecting and uh, drought end. So uh, very excited about this series of talks, and we lead off first with Marty Hurling. So Marty, I'm going to transfer control over to your computer now. And then just share your screen with us. Bring your slides up and let it rip. Just waiting for the um, share icon. Okay, are you guys in uh, the WebEx? Application right now? Yep. Okay. Uh, do you see a quick start tab on the top left of the screen of the window? Yes. Click okay. that. Okay. Click, click that, and then you'll see the share my desktop button. Oh, got it. All right. Good to go? Yeah, it looks great. Go ahead, Marty. Okay. Thanks. You got it. So Dan asked me to first uh, spend about five minutes on giving an overview of what the um, second rendition of the NOAA Drought Task Force is up to. So I'll do that first before getting into some of the interesting science talk. The uh, Task Force uh, second rendition here is um, comprised of about oh, almost 20 different PIs, and I'll have a summary slide of that in just a minute. Uh, Dan and Anna Reed are the program managers. Dan has been doing the heavy lifting on this. And um, Mark Svoboda and Randy Koster, Eric Wood, and myself are science leads on this um, activity, this uh, second stage. And it has uh, multiple institutions represented across different universities and different uh, government labs. So um, really, it, it canvasses a lot of different expertise on drought from land surface, uh, atmospheric dynamics, modeling, and so forth. Uh, the activity began in, uh, I think, October of 2014, and uh, we hope to run here through 2017. There's about three core themes that the various projects and PIs um, basically fall into. One is a monitoring theme, and, and the goal here is to, is to do a better job of characterizing drought. This is sort of um, looking at the, the merits of different indices that describe the state of drought, um, the land surface, the um, reservoir conditions, uh, soil moisture, um, stream flow, um, and so forth. So it's trying to do a better job of monitoring, to know what to monitor, to give a good idea of what the condition on the ground is. Short-term prediction is another group of activities. Basically, what are the atmospheric processes that, that help dictate and maybe a forewarn of, an, of a rapid onset for drought or for retreat and um, recovery? And then some droughts, uh, such as the California situation, for instance, has been long long lived, four years now, um, the most severe four-year drought. And so we have a group of activities looking into the processes that can give memory to this phenomena over North America, either memory induced by the ocean or some other processes that are yet to be um, enumerated in these studies. Um, just to give a quick indication about some of the activities that, that sort of canvases across several different PIs who come together to do um, reports. So the most recent one came out in September of 2014, led by uh, Lamont Doherty and Richard Seeger, um, who is the lead author of an assessment on causes and predictability at that time of the California drought from 2011 to 2014. Attack another year onto that, and that report came out 
Um, there's a peer review paper now that is um, soon to come out on that study. And so one of, the, one of the purposes of the task force in an aggregate is to communicate the science, and this is one way that has been found to be pretty effective. There was a report prior to this on the Great Plains drought. Another way that we've been out in the field, so to speak, and, and learning about the use of drought information and its impact is through a workshop and conferences. And one very recent one that I thought was quite successful uh, was the Chapman Conference at Irvine on the California drought. It was very focused, had about 100 attendees. Um, was organized and led by uh, the Drought Task Force and um, the University of California, Irvine, Amir, and, and his um, associates, and um, it lasted for three days and at the end of April. Um, there is a um, collection of all of the talks and the PowerPoints that were presented there that Amir has. Maybe he can tell us later where that's located. There is still an active website that has a lot of the agenda and materials uh, posted for the AGU chapter. Just, just do a Google search on California drought. So that was a quick background. Um, now on to uh, some science um, looking at the uh, trends in rainy season precipitation. And rainy season precipitation, I'm focusing on here is the springtime. Um, and the issues that we're looking at is that there have been a variety of rainy seasons, the springtime that have failed across the globe over the last 35, 40 year period. Um, the Horn of Africa, um, the Southwest Asian region, Southeast China, uh, parts of the Murray-Darling Basin, not particularly their rainy season, uh, the U.S. Great Plains, which is a wet time of year, and the American Southwest. And so the question that we ask is why has this happened? Um, are these linked, uh, these very diverse regional drought trends, have they been physically linked through some common cause? And if we understand that, can we say something about what's likely to happen next? Are these just to be uh, continued, or do we expect these to be uh, in recovery mode in the not too distant future? So I'm trying to give you um, the answer, at least based on what we have so far, to those questions, and hopefully I'll have enough time to give you the evidence. Um, so this is work that has been done collaboratively here with um, scientists at, at the Physical Sciences Division in NOAA, Chao Wei Kwan and John Aishai, Brant Leitman, um, and uh, soon to be Andy Hoyle, who at the time was with um, University of California in Santa Barbara, um, with Chris Funk, and then Ileana Blade is from University of Barcelona in Spain. So we have a very diverse team. So these are sort of the highlight bullets of what we've um, come up with so far from our research. We find that many of these March, April, May drying trends since 1979 have indeed been strongly forced, uh, that they have had a common cause and that they've been connected in that cause through the effect of SST variations in this 35-year period. That the trend part of the SST is the dominant factor, not the details of the interannual variability per se, but the residual of that uh, or the decadal component of that as expressed through a trend. And that it would appear that the trend that has been most relevant has been the, um, a pattern of increasing gradient between the warm pool regions and the cold tongue in the East Pacific, rather than some globally uniform warming. Uh, and that these recent regional drought trends are more likely to be transitory, and that recovery in the near term is probable, although we can't say what near term really means here, unfortunately. So onto some of the evidence. So here, here's a very simple view of the uh, March, April, May climatological precipitation. And where you see blue shades is where that particular season is a wet time of year compared to the other seasons. And where you see the, uh, the tans or reds is where it's a dry time. So the, the rainy seasons, so to speak, are especially prominent in the Greater Horn of Africa and Southwest Asia, Afghanistan, um, Southeast China, uh, the Great Plains you can see, and the Nordeste region of South America. And, and one of the tools that we'll be using in this analysis is um, a set of climate simulations using the European Center version 5 atmospheric model, which we run globally at about 85 kilometer resolution. Uh, there's a whole set of ensembles that I'll share with you in a moment that cover the historical period 1979 to 2014. And so I'll be sharing those results. But first, I wanted to show you the um, climatological March, April, May precip for the model as a comparison. And so if I can toggle this back and forth, you can see that the model does a reasonably good job in picking up the areas 
that I just mentioned that are wet times of year um, in Asia, Horn of Africa, Southeast China, the Great Plains, and um, the Nordeste region of Brazil. And then here what you're seeing in the next slide is the result of 30 simulations of the historical record, an ensemble of 30, forced with the uh, global SST variability, the global sea ice variability, radio forcing specified. So these are so-called historical runs of the latter part of the 20th century into the early 21st century. And for each of those 30 runs, we calculate the trend in, in March, April, May precipitation, and we average the 30 trends from those 30 ensemble members. And that's what you're seeing. And it, the uh, map expresses the change in precip as a percent of climatology of the model over that 35-year period. So here where you're seeing the uh, sort of the reds or tans is where you're seeing the drying trends of the model simulation in response to the forcing evolving um, at the lower boundary or at the top of the atmosphere through radio factors. And the greens are where the precipitation has been increasing. So I'm going to toggle back and forth to sort of make the point here that for the most part what you're seeing is that the areas that are wet are the areas that have been getting drier. So the climatological wet areas are drying as a forced response in the ECAM, with the notable exception that the Nordeste region in Brazil has become wetter in this simulation, not drier, but the other areas, the Great Plains, American Southwest, and now Tom will talk more about that, um, Southeast China, the Afghan region, parts of the Middle East and the Horn of Africa have gotten materially drier in the simulation. And then I'm going to toggle here. This, this image, at least on my screen, for the observed is, does not show up very nicely. But uh, so this toggling is maybe not very useful. But the point is, and you can do it later yourself, is there's a nice correspondence between the drying areas that have been occurring, as I mentioned, and those that the model is simulating to be drying as a forced response. So what's going on here is, is, is what we've been trying to figure out. And in the first rendition of some additional idealized model experiments, what we've done is to simply take uh, the 35-year trend in sea surface temperatures since 1979 and ask the question whether if we reduce the complexity of the system to just the response to this trend, in other words, all other factors are actually kept the same, um, the radio forcing will be kept the same, the sea ice variability will be kept constant, and only this forcing as a fixed SST anomaly is going to drive another set of experiments. And the question is whether this trend pattern that's been observed is the culprit for the regional drawings that we've been experiencing that this model is simulating. So the notable feature here is that most of the ocean is warmed, um, it, with the exception that the East Pacific has cooled. The global ocean has warmed about 0.3 degrees in this 35-year in this record. Now, there's some new analyses, new data sets that may suggest that that number needs to be revised based on um, new and, and, and corrected data sets. But as you'll see in a moment, that issue is immaterial to the factors that we are going to be identifying in terms of factors driving these regional precip sensitivities. The global ocean change here is 0.3 degrees in the 35-year period. So a warming rate of about 0.1 degree per decade in this um, experiment. I'm sorry, in this period since 1979. So here in this next slide, what you're seeing is the sensitivity of the uh, ECAM-5 model to just that specified um, SST trend for the season March, April, May. And what you can see, I think, pretty readily is, again, the, the drying areas, I should say the dry areas in this simulation, are very much aligned with the areas in the fully varying, fully forced experiment that I showed you earlier. So the Horn of Africa, Southwest Asia, Southeast China, and good portions of North America show a substantial dry sensitivity to just the trend of SST. And again, the exceptional wet season in the Nordeste actually becomes wetter, not, not drier. So um, we wanted to explore this in a little more detail to, to try to get an assessment of what aspect of this trend in SST is operating in terms of the physics of what may be driving these drying trends. So again, the upper panel you'd seen a moment ago, that's the trend in the observed SST. And then in the um, middle and lower panels, you're seeing the historical uh, forced experiments of the um, CMIP-5 models. CMIP-5 in, here includes 30 some odd different uh, centers running the transient experiments from 1979 to present. Um, uh, Post-2005, there's a scenario in these experiments, and it's the RCP 8.5. 
Um, the lower one is the result of a large ensemble of a, one single model, the uh, NCAR CESM, the Earth System model. So it's also a 30-member ensemble. And the story is very similar for these two, and that is that the global ocean has a fairly uniform warming in this 35-year period, which has reasonable agreement in many areas that have been observed to warm, but clearly has a substantial difference from what has actually happened in the Pacific Basin. And, and so we're going to explore what this uh, uniform warming effect is relative to the more structured pattern in additional experiments. But before going there, I just wanted to uh, talk just for a moment about how do we understand this, this substantial difference between the global ocean warming that's been observed and the global ocean temperature change that's being simulated in the CMIP-5 types of models. Um, the observed warming since 1979 has been about 0.3 degrees Celsius. And I think that would be pretty much close to the number even in, if we took into account these new adjustments that have been put forward um, by the former National Climate Data Center. Um, here this analysis is using the Harel SST, which is basically OIV2 in a recent period. By contrast, what you're seeing are distribution functions, frequency distributions fit to the 30 members of the CMIP-5, that's the red, and the 30 members of the CESM-1, which is blue. And the individual tick marks at the bottom show each single run. And so clearly the, the coupled model of response to rate of forcing is of a greater warming than what's been observed. But there are samples, very few of them, but there are a few of them that produce a modest amount of warming akin to the magnitude of what's been observed. And in fact, um, one of the runs of the CESM1, you can see one blue tick mark is virtually the same as the observed. And the interpretation of that distribution function is very clean because each run has the same rate of forcing and the same sensitivity in, in terms of it's the same GCM being used. That spread in the blue distribution is unequivocally due to internal coupled ocean atmosphere noise. So this analysis would allow us to argue that perhaps the observed modest amount of warming, which is modest because of the East Pacific that hasn't warmed at all since 1979, could be reconciled with strong internal variability. And I think um, Tom's talk will talk more to that in, 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 in a moment. So he, what we've done in a set of additional experiments is we've, we've done um, idealizations in which we, we back out a certain amount of warming from the um, sea surface temperature um, trend pattern that I had shown you a moment ago. So in the figure that you see right now, the, um, the global SST has been cooled uniformly at all grid points by two-tenths of a degree Celsius. That's a small amount. It's, it's even smaller than the uncertainty in what various analyses are saying may be the warming rate that's occurred. Um, so here we're actually going to ask, what is the sensitivity of our regional drawings to having cooled the ocean by 0.2 degrees C in this sort of arbitrary GFD type of exercise? So we rerun the ECAM-5 with a large ensemble with this particular SST anomaly. And we're going to do it with one additional SST forcing where we do a more drastic amount of cooling. We're going to back out four tenths degree, which is more than the global warming that's been observed over the oceans, but something closer to the value that some of these CMIP models are indicating may have occurred in response to radio forcing. And we remove it uniformly because that is the impression that is being given by the CMIP models. At this point, there's no compelling reason to remove anything but a uniform pattern. And so here you can see that residual is, is actually now showing um, a pretty balanced amount of warm regions and cool regions, but the Pacific sector is clearly the dominant anomalous state in this configuration. So on to the sensitivity. So here's the result of another set of um, ECAM-5 experiments where we cooled the ocean by two tenths, uh, but the pattern still has sort of this horseshoe, sort of PDO-like, and so decadal-like structure to it. And you can see that, by and large, the same sensitivity emerges without getting into great detail, but you can still see the Horn of Africa drying. You can see Southwest Asia, North America, and again, uh, Southeast China. Um, nor Nordeste seems to be insensitive. It's slightly wetter. And if we back out a, a, a more substantial amount of cooling point four, you still see, in particular, the, the Northeast um, Horn of Africa, Southeast China, um, most of North America still shows a substantial uh, trend toward dry conditions. So the, the message here is, is that um, it's the pattern rather than the uniform warming. It's the pattern of the SFT trend that seems to be very important. So um, just to summarize, I'll, I'll just read this. Um, so what you heard, or at least what I hope you heard, 
Um, but we've, what we're finding here is that major boreal spring rainy seasons have failed in the recent decade or so uh, across the globe. Uh, it's, uh, you've heard about the greater horn drying. This has really been a focus of a lot of research. Uh, Southwest Asia, uh, maybe less well known, the Southeast China drying. Uh, the Murray Darling Basin, I didn't really focus on much here. It's really not their rainy season. Uh, the U.S. Great Plains and the American Southwest has been a focus, and, and, and Tom will touch on that in more detail. What we're doing here is we're trying to seek an understanding of this global pattern, um, and we used a hierarchy of model simulations to, to get that understanding. We used historical forcings of the atmosphere, and we also used idealized forcings to look at plausible factors that may have been at play. Um, I think what we're learning here is that the various droughts are indeed uh, related to each other, and that they're related through some common and strong forced effect on the atmosphere. Uh, this drying pattern um, has unfolded because there exists a common sensitivity. And it's really interesting because the mechanisms that deliver rain in these different areas are very different from each other. There are different storm tracks, and some areas are not storm tracks at all. Uh, some areas are convective. Some cases, they are storms from the Pacific. In some cases, um, that they involve other mechanisms uh, entirely. But despite the diversity of processes, they all seem to be drying in these regions in the spring rainy seasons for a common SST-driven cause. Our tentative view is that the key element of these uh, drought trends have been natural, and that not, they're not strongly tied to a global uniform increase in the ocean temperatures. Uh, and a better understanding of this emergent situation we think is essential to an improved awareness of whether or when these drought trends are likely to intensify or reverse. Our results would indicate that they're transitory, that these areas will recover as the pattern of SFT internal variability begins to sort of uh, return to normal. It may even overshoot, and we may see a different mode emerge in the coming decades. And then that's all I have. Marty, that was great, and thanks also for giving the intro about the Drought Task Force. Um, I am sure that you stimulated some questions with that one. Um, so for those who are logged in remotely through WebEx, the way to ask a question is to go to the participant menu. So if you go to the top of your screen, there should be a green or blue bar, click participants. And then at the bottom left-hand corner of the window that pops up, there should be a logo of a, a hand um, which you can click, and that'll let me know you have a question. And once you raise your hand virtually, uh, I'll be able to unmute your line. If you're having trouble figuring that out, you can also just send me a chat message and let me know that you have a question, and I'll do the same thing. I'll unmute your line for that. So um, while we wait to see if any questions roll in, um, Ann Rita or anyone else in the room have a, have a question? Yeah, Ann Rita. Hi, Marty. Uh, I'm wondering uh, whether you have looked whether this uh, change in, uh, in spring precip is uh, sort of a a change in the, the shift in the seasonal cycle, or um, is a you know a, an absolute sort of decrease in annual precip? So, yeah. So basically, whether it, it really changes the seasonal cycle, I guess that's the question. Great question. I, we haven't looked at that. Um, I can see looking at that in more detail. So that's a good good point. Right now, I would make a. It sort of a, my quick sense is that because the seasonal cycle that I've emphasized here has a distinct rainy season, like take the Horn of Africa, I, I doubt we're talking about a shift in seasonal cycle to first order. I think we're looking at a seasonally dependent sensitivity to first order instead. But, but that's a great point. We'll follow up on that. Uh, there's a question from Tim Del Sol. Tim, are you on the line? I just unmuted your line. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Hi Tim. Go ahead. Um, can you say again, I, I just didn't quite catch it, what exactly or precisely was the SST pattern you used in your atmosphere GCM experiment? Right. So let's see if I can scroll to that. So there's a host of them. Of course, in the fully forced experiments, it's transient, time evolving. But in the idealized experiments, uh, let me scroll a little bit higher. What we did is we took, for instance, in that first set, you see now this SST map. What that is is the 35-year change in degree C as an anomaly of SSTs. And so that anomaly, as you see it, in its full pattern and magnitude, was superimposed on the 1981 to 2010 climatological SST. And we ran a set of 50-year integrations, one that was with the climatological SST and the other with the superimposed anomaly. And then later in the runs, we repeated that um, forced experiment, but we backed out 
two tenths degree in globally uniform warming. So that's the pattern that was done in the second set of 50 year runs. And then the third set used this pattern. So you just subtracted four tenths of a degree everywhere. That's right. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question, Tim. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment, so Marty, thanks a lot. Really appreciate the talk. Very interesting work. Bet. Okay, next up is Tom Delworth. Tom, are you on the line? I am. Great. Okay, I'm going to transfer control over to your computer. Is it working? Do you see it? Yeah. It looks great, so whenever you're ready, go ahead, Tom. Thanks. All right, thanks very much. What I wanted to uh, describe today are some analyses, some results we've done, looking at, at links between the hiatus in global warming over the past decade or more and nor North American drought. And a lot of this is summarized in, in a paper that appeared last month in Journal of Climate, if you'd like to see more details. So I want to just briefly talk about the hiatus, and, and we can ask, is that term still valid? The paper that Marty referred to last week from Tom Carl looking at some uh, new uh, modifications to observations and puts that into a little bit of question, but I don't think that is at all relevant for the process we were talking about in this uh, work today, which actually have a lot of similarity with what Marty was describing in terms of the role of the Pacific Ocean in driving large-scale hydroclimate variations. So we really want to focus on is, is the role of these Pacific decadal scale wind stress changes, in, in fact, for driving both Pacific Ocean changes and atmospheric changes that, that teleconnect actually globally but are of high relevance for North American decadal scale droughts. That'll be the core focus here. We can first, though, talk about the hiatus and some of the processes driving it and why we suggest there's a link between the processes driving up the hiatus and North American uh, hydroclimate. I'd like to point here to two key papers, really, in the last few years, one by Kosaka and C, and one by Matt England and colleagues. In the first Kosaka and Z paper, they really pin down the role of the equatorial Pacific in, in driving the hiatus, or at least projecting a cooling signal to, to the planet. They took an ensemble of coupled models and, and prescribed SSTs in the equatorial Pacific and were able to actually reproduce many aspects of the hiatus. So that's a key paper in pointing towards the equatorial Pacific. That was followed up by Matt England and colleagues who looked at the same area and suggested that stronger than normal easterly winds in the tropical Pacific have played a key role by driving upwelling and cooling the eastern Pacific, and that signal is uncommunicated to the rest of the planet. So in the bottom left here is actually a, a map using a, a model simulation of the kinds of changes in sea surface temperature that England and colleagues derived when they applied the observed wind stress changes, which is an enhancement of the easterly winds in the tropics. And they get this broad scale cooling, and if you remember Marty's figure, this actually is quite reminiscent of that structure of SST pattern changes. So this is the response to these strong winds. And in their study, they actually look at what happens to global temperature, and they show that when you impose these winds, you cool the planet, and then what happens in the future depends a lot on what happens to the winds. So these winds are, are key drivers, obviously the tropical Pacific. They've had a big imprint there, and we'll suggest they actually have a big impact on the uh, North American hydroclimates. So that's where we come in, is doing a whole series of simulations which try and probe that relationship in somewhat greater detail really looking at the connections between the large-scale state of the tropical Pacific and North American hydroclimate on decadal scales. So if we look at this top panel, this is the time series now of wind stress in the uh, central Pacific. These are derived from the ECMWF reanalyses. And so these blue bars here indicate enhanced easterly winds starting late 1990s till the uh, period really after 2010. And the figure in the middle left shows the in vector form, the spatial pattern of these wind stress differences. So we have this enhancement of the mean easterly winds in the tropical Pacific. So the goal of this work is really to evaluate the climatic impact of those observed interannuals, really decadal scale variations in tropical wind stress. And we'll see in particular they are related to North American hydroclimate, actually sharing many of the same sort of connections that Marty was just showing. So we use a whole suite of, of coupled atmosphere models to, to probe these effects, to try and link these wind stress changes to North American hydroclimate. Here's a schematic of a typical coupled ocean atmosphere model, the atmosphere on top, ocean on the bottom. And they typically communicate by exchanging heat, water, and momentum fluxes. And these fluxes are calculated based on the gradients, the differences between the atmosphere and the ocean. 
So we have the large sets of simulations that are just control simulations with these fluxes exchange. What we do then is to conduct additional sets of simulations in which we intervene in that calculation. So rather than giving the ocean the wind stress that the atmosphere wants to give, the atmospheric model rather, we override that and put in the wind stress from observed anomalies. And so we use sets of coupled models to perform lots of simulations to explore this. Matter of fact, we use three coupled models here for the simulations we'll describe. They're related from a related family of models, but they are different models. All are global coupled ocean atmosphere models, all share about a 100 kilometer resolution ocean, but they differ a lot in the atmosphere. The coarsest resolution version of this set is the CM2.1 model with a roughly 200 kilometer atmospheric grid. Then we have a much higher resolution atmosphere, a 50 kilometer atmosphere, it's called FLOR. And finally, we call FLOR FA, where FA stands for flux adjustment. So FLOR FA is identical to FLOR, except that we apply a numerical technique called flux adjustments to reduce the mean state bias at the surface. So we have these three different models that we run through the same sets, sorts of simulation experiments to try and probe the impact of wind stress change in the tropical Pacific. So we use ensembles of two different flavors, one in which we include all the historical radiative forcings, greenhouse gases, aerosols, et cetera, and a second ensemble in which we include those exact same forcings, plus we add in this extra wind stress, or rather override the wind stress, so the model ocean feels the observed interannual variations of wind stress. And so all of these uh, simulations are conducted over the period 1979 to 2013. So when we do that, these are the sorts of patterns of response we get. This is the surface temperature response to the imposition of those wind stresses over the period of the hiatus, cooling in the tropical Pacific, northeastern Pacific, warming in the off-equatorial mid-latitude zones. This is a trend in SST from the England All paper for that same period, very similar to the pattern that Marty showed previously. This is now the subsurface ocean response. Since we're using a fully coupled ocean atmosphere model, we can probe the interior of the ocean, how that responds as well. And these orange and uh, red colors indicate substantial warming in the subsurface tropical western Pacific and cooling in the eastern Pacific. So that's associated with these stronger than normal easterly winds piling up warm water in the west. These are the trends in sea surface height in the England et al. paper, again, showing increase in sea surface height here. That's associated with that uh, enhanced subsurface warming in the Western Pacific. So the model in response to imposing these observed wind stress anomalies is reproducing many of the sorts of trends and patterns of temperature change we see in the tropical and extratropical Pacific, not just at the surface, but also at the subsurface. And so now we can ask, what, is this, what relevance is this for a North American hydroclimate? And here's the connection. This is the difference in upper atmosphere geopotential height between these simulations in which we impose these extra tropical Pacific wind stresses versus our, our standard uh, simulation. So we see these blue areas indicate reductions in geopotential height, and that's associated with this broad, large scale cooling of the tropics, associated with these enhanced east of the winds pulling up cold water from the subsurface. From the changes in the upper tropical troposphere, a pattern radiates uh, out both ways connecting on a planetary scale, really, with these ridges in mid-latitudes of both hemispheres. And of course, this ridging extends from the Central Pacific into the southwestern part of North America, and you might imagine that would be associated with reductions in precipitation, and it is. And so this is the connection, obviously, and this has been explored in many papers, really the role of, of cooling in the eastern Pacific in connecting to North American hydroclimate. So now we want to look at more carefully in these simulations, and what is the response to these tropical Pacific wind stress changes, which induce this large-scale pattern of SST changes in the Pacific, what's the response of North American precipitation? So we'll look at this in all of our models, but first we'll assess how well do the models simulate the mean state climatology precipitation, and then we'll examine their response. So in this panel, we show the observed annual mean uh, precipitation over North America. The brown colors indicate low values, blue colors indicate high values of precipitation. These are in units of millimeters per day. The three models are in the other three panels, CM2.1, the coarsest resolution, FLOR, the higher resolution atmosphere, and then FLOR FA, the flux adjustment, where we're re reducing the biases over the ocean in order to improve the main state. And we can see the simulation in the coarse resolution model is probably the uh, least faithful of the three, consistent with the low resolution and the inability to resolve topographic features. The bottom right is floor that's an improvement as we go to higher resolution. We're beginning to pick up the dry line through the central interior of North America. We're getting a drier western U.S. We're getting some of the 
uh, orographic precipitation. And the bottom left shows the flux adjusted model, and it's clearly the best of the three. By including the higher resolution and by reducing the mean state bias, we're actually able to simulate precipitation most faithfully. Now, with this background, let's turn to how these models respond to the tropical Pacific wind stress changes in terms of their precipitation changes. So shown here in the upper left is the observed change, this large-scale drawing. This is for the decade of 2002 to 2012, minus the previous uh, 22 years. So this, we have this drawing over uh, Western North America. How do the models do? What, what does the wind stress change do in the models? These are the changes of precipitation in all three different simulations. These are all ensemble means, which are presented here. So they all present drawing over western and southwestern parts of the United States and North America. These are all on the same color scale of units, so they're quite comparable here. Uh, if we, we might say that this floor flux adjustment might be closest, but maybe not. All three have this uh, strong drawing. So we're looking here as if the drawing is a very mean response, but in reality, there's a lot of internal variability in the system. And so rather than looking at this in terms of the maps of mean responses, we can get a more probabilistic assessment on the sorts of changes that these tropical Pacific wind stress uh, variations induce. So if we take these areas that are outlined now by the sort of purple dashed lines over Western North America, from each of these three different simulations, we have a lot of years of simulations in which we have the altered wind stress. So what we can do is resample from that large population of simulations with the altered wind stress. So we can resample and form a large PDF of the probability of 11 year mean anomalies in precipitation. We can do the same thing from a comparable population of simulations without that wind stress forcing. And so we can look at how does this extra wind stress forcing in the tropical Pacific, how does that alter the PDF of precipitation, annual mean precipitation over Western North America? And that's shown here. So the x-axis is now the amount of the precipitation anomaly for an 11-year mean, a decadal scale mean, over this big box of Western North America. So to the right means wetter, to the left means uh, drier. The y-axis is the cumulative probability distribution, uh, starting from uh, very small values and going forward. This gray and black symbols, and to some extent the red line as well, indicate the cumulative PDF of precipitation when you don't have these anomalous wind stresses that we've seen in the last decade. So you can see these values are very low. They go up, they hit 0 0.5, right, the probability right around a mean of zero, and then continue up. The blue line is what happens to that distribution when we impose these tropical Pacific wind stress anomalies. The entire distribution is shifted substantially to the left, showing that the effect of these tropical wind stress anomalies is a really bias the whole system. It means it has a very strong predisposition towards decadal drying over this broad aggregate area of Western North America. So in particular, this is the observed change over that period. In the sort of control simulations, the probability is maybe 5%. By increasing, by imposing these wind stress anomalies, we boosted that probably to about 35%. We still need some realizations of internal variability to get that sort of drawing, but it's just made much more likely by the presence of these uh, wind stress anomalies. So that's for the, when we combine all three different models, which have differing simulation characteristics we can now focus on doing the exact same analysis if we just use this flux adjusted model with the higher resolution. Further, we've actually done an additional large simulation, 30 member ensemble with that high resolution model, both with and without these wind stress forcings. And so we can get a different perspective on the change of the PDF in just that high resolution flux adjusted model, which has the best climatological simulation and precipitation. So if we do the same diagram, but now just for that high res model, we get an even more dramatic shifting of the PDF. The red line is the distribution of the PDF when you don't have the wind stress forcing. The blue is when you add the wind stress forcing. So we've made a, a rather unlikely event into a 50-50 or better proposition when we add these wind stress. The effect of the wind stress is really to alter the likelihood of the probability of stacking the deck in terms of decadal scale hydroclimate over Western North America. It's not strictly deterministic, but you've stacked the deck quite a bit. Now, that was looking over this large area of Western North America. What about smaller areas and shorter uh, regional scales? So if we use the exact same simulations, and now just look at California. Look at California, and look at three-year mean California precipitation. Uh, in four years, we'd be a very similar picture. So this is from the standard simulation, and this blue curve now is from the simulation with enhanced tropical winds. The shift is not nearly as dramatic, but still you have altered the likelihood of dry conditions over California for a three-year stretch by virtue of this altered base state in the tropical Pacific. 
So the bottom line here is that for a smaller region, such as California, relative to the whole western part of the United States, and shorter time scales, three years versus 11 years, you have less impact from this tropical Pacific boundary forcing and a larger role for internal variability. So again, the smaller spatial scales, shorter time scales, a bigger role of internal variability. The larger spatial scales, longer time scales, we have a more deterministic, and the PDFs have shifted quite a bit more. So we can ask, of course, what's going to happen in the future if these wind stress anomalies have been contributing towards shifting the likelihood of drought over Western North America. These are two additional simulations we've conducted over the period of 2014 to 2022. In the top panel, we just let the model do its own thing. We didn't intervene. And these show the time series of uh, percent changes in precipitation over that big box of North America. Green indicates wet, brown indicates dry. So it's just bouncing around. There's zero mean change. If instead, over that same period, we replay the observed wind stress anomalies we've seen over the last 10 years, for the next 10 years, we continue this drying trend. There's a lot of year-to-year -year variability, but the overall trend is clearly for a dry decade. So the real story is what happens over the next decade is the story of what happens to wind stress anomalies. We've also done many idealized experiments along these lines, not putting in the observed wind stress anomalies, but putting in idealized wind stress anomalies. And the bottom line, we can show that that with idealized wind stress anomalies, we have a connection to the hiatus over a, a short time scale. This is the cooling and uh, created global mean cooling induced by idealized wind stresses rather than actual wind stress anomalies. They only persist for 10 or 20 years, and then the planet recovers from that. That subsurface warming, at least in our models, that we see in the subtropical or subsurface Western Pacific actually escapes from the, from the tropics and, and comes back to the surface, reemerges, offsetting the cooling. However, the link to Eastern Pacific temperatures and southwestern precipitation remains strong. So even though there's this transient link between this hiatus cooling and hydroclimate over North America, that's a very transient uh, link. So concluding, this uh, very prolonged, unusually strong tropical easterly winds clearly contribute to this tropical Pacific and even global surface cooling. And not only the surface cooling, but this very strong structured pattern of response that we see in tropical, in tropical and extratropical Pacific. Marty showed from atmosphere-only experiments its impact on hydroclimate we're taking a little different tactic using fully coupled model now in which we impose wind stress anomalies, but also come to the conclusion that this pattern also drives large-scale hydroclimate. We focus on North America, but as you might infer from that map of geopotential changes, there are global-scale implications from this. And this process leads to substantially increased odds of drought over Western North America. I didn't really focus on this, but idealized simulations show the hiatus effect, this global cooling associated with this process is actually a temporary. Now, some key issues is what drives these anomalous easterly winds. From one paradigm, the, tropical, the whole Pacific is simply a coupled ocean atmosphere system with a lot of variability. So these period of enhanced winds may be no more than an expression of internal variability of the entire Pacific, which would go away. But there are also possibilities that these enhanced easterly winds may have some remote expression, for example, from the Atlantic, and a paper by McGregor, a colleague, suggests that. Or perhaps there's some other forcing. So it's really key to understand that better. Is this purely due to internal processes in, tropi in the tropical and extropical Pacific, or is there some remote? A, a key question then is can we predict the evolution of those tropical winds and their impact on North American drought? And I don't think the responses or the uh, uh, analyses right now are too optimistic on that point. But the real key point is that there's a very large component of natural decayal variability of hydroclimate over Western North America. And we really need to, to understand that when considering human impacts. And for the persistence of the, of the current drought, it all depends on, on this, in, at least from these simulations, on what happens to the winds. And we suggest that that's mainly a transient effect likely due to natural variability and isn't really a response to global climate change. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, Tom. Um, so again, for those who are logged in via WebEx, to ask a question, go to the participant um, box on the top of your screen, click that, and then there's a hand raise logo at the bottom left, click that, and then I'll see you have a question. I can unmute your line or send me a chat message. I don't see any questions yet, Tom, so we'll wait it out for a moment. Any questions in the room here? Okay, actually, uh, Tim Del Sol has a question for you, Tom. So, Tim, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, go hey, ahead, Tom. Tim. Uh, thanks. Um, I just had a simple question. I wasn't sure I understood. Uh, why didn't the stress, when you showed the PDF for the for the response to the shift to the stress, why didn't it shift for the 1979 to 2000? Uh, I think it was the figure before this one. Yeah. Actually, that's a very good question, a very perceptive question, I have to say. We derive the climatology, we use that as our base state. 
and then the period after that was the anomalous period. So it, it's a matter of, you'd actually just shift the PDF one way there, depending on how you define the climatology. But that's why, so I, I, I assume you're, this particular experiment you're saying here, that's Correct. really the base state. That's really the base state we're defining as our wind stress, which is corresponds to um, uh, this, this, this period. So we're defining this period as our base, and then these are departures from that base. Really looking at the differences between the sort of 2002 to 2012 period relative to the previous 22 years. Gotcha. Thanks. Very perceptive. Great. Thanks for the question, Tim. Um, Tom, I don't see any other questions right now, so thank you for the presentation. Okay. Oh, actually, sorry, hold on one sec. Another question just came in. Tom, you're still there, right? I'm here, yes. Okay, great. So this question is from uh, Sultan Hamid. Uh, Sultan, are you on the line? Yes, I am. So uh, so my question is that, so very interesting talk, uh, uh, but uh, so the wind stress, the, the imposed wind stress was applied for what duration, and was it held constant uh, during yes. that period? Thank you, yes. We did many different versions of this, but in the, in the primary results I showed, we actually took the observed sequence of monthly anomalies of wind stress from the ECMWF reanalysis over the period 1979 to 2013 and applied those month by month in the model simulation. So the monthly evolution of wind stress anomalies in the model is that taken from the ECMWF reanalysis. We have done separate sensitivity experiments in which we create an idealized uniform block of easterly wind stress anomalies in the Pacific, and we simply hold that fixed for 100 years and see what happens. And the results are actually quite similar. It's simply an enhancement of the easterly wind stress that is key here. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Tom, for taking the questions and for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, great. So up next is uh, Amir. Amir, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Okay, great. I'm going to throw control over to your computer. <coughs> Can you see my screen? Yeah. Great. Okay, hey, great. So Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Thanks, Amir. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to change the topic a little bit. Uh, we've been working on uh, short-term seasonal precipitation forecasting using a hybrid approach where we combine dynamic and statistical models. Um, I am sure you have seen figures like this. This is an example of December, January, February forecast for the 2014. And uh, California drought, it's just, just look at the Western US. On the right, you have ensemble mean of NMME um, predictions, which was basically above average precipitation. But the observations on the left shows that uh, basically we ended up having a major drought in California. So this is just one example of um, a low predictability of some of the dynamic model simulations. Um, of course, it's not always like this. Um, but uh, this is just one example um, for an extreme event. And the same thing applies to statistical model predictions. Um, we have baseline probabilistic models like the one on the left, probabilistic forecast available from multiple sources, including our own website. But again, there is no physics there. It is dominated by initial conditions. Or you can see on the right, um, El Nino and La Nina relationship and precipitation for California. This is um, from Kelly Redmond. Um, and you can see again, um, basically the dots are all over the place. So uh, even an analog year based approach cannot really help us with, uh, uh, with, with uh, job prediction. But when you look at historical events, sometimes a statistical model works better, sometimes a dynamic model simulations. So we have been uh, working on a framework to combine um, an analog year-based model and um, dynamic model simulations like NMME and combine them together in a consistent way and produce better seasonal precipitation forecasts. And we are taking two different approaches, and I'm going to just talk about the one on the top where we 
focus on combining an anal statistical analog year based model and uh, NMME uh, predictions. Um, so uh, we have been also talking to um, California decision makers, Department of Water Resources, to see about to 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 understand their needs. And this came up also in our uh, chapter and drought conference that Marty mentioned uh, at the beginning of his talk. Uh, one of the things they um, pointed out that they they will be happy if we can just tell them um, whether in the next three months, six months, precipitation is going to be above average, below average, or near normal. And they define above average to be around 66 percentile, below average 33 percentile, and near normal in between. So if you have time series, I have just two red lines as examples of 66 and 33 percentile, and they just want to know where they're going to be in the next three months or six months. So uh, first I will talk a little bit about the statistical model part, and then uh, NMME and how we process the data. Um, the statistical side, it's basically a model that combines um, neural network and, um, and dependent concepts for understand for deriving a relationship between large scale climatic patterns like uh, um, again and PDO and Nino La Nina information and relating it to not just precipitation but probability of precipitation being above average, below average, or near normal. Um, and of course we use um, climatic indicators. So it's like an analog year approach where um, where basically uh, we first develop a neural network model to understand how um, years are similar in historical record to find similar years. And, and then we have a copula based model where you translate your PDF of your near past data to PDF of predictions in your pre prediction period let's say the next three months or six months. And it gives you an ensemble and you can get probability of precipitation above or below any threshold. So on the below panel I have, um, on the bottom panel I have, for example, example um, application to forecast October to January. This is a running forecast that you leave. Basically you start from the beginning and you predict the next year and it goes to the next year and you go to the next year. The dots are, uh, observations and the red line is predictions. And the below normal, above normal, and near normal statistics are there. You can see the statistics looks good, like 88% um, below normal are captured, or 95% um, near normal, 77% um, above normal. But I think still this is not good enough, and I will explain why. Um, so this is again the same figure, um, larger you can see how it works. In this example, this particular example, we're looking at precipitation conditioned on uh, SOI and PDO in previous months, basically. Um, so it does not rely on SO, pre predicted SOI, only historical record, and near past conditions. Uh, this is another uh, example um, for October through March a different period, but again, precipitation condition on SOI and PDO. I don't go into details of the method, but I'll be happy to share the details. The conditioning part is based on a Bayesian-based approach, and the dependence part is based on the relationship between near past and prediction component using copulas and neural network for finding analog years. Um, and this is another example you can see below normal is around 68 percent not not as good as the previous one above normal 86 percent but this this um, still is not ideal because if you have an extreme event that you have never seen before your model will never be able to capture it so I think this is interesting this is good but this is not ideal but we will use this and we will combine it with dynamic predictions in a second so this is the general framework so we have a statistical model like the one that I mentioned and that's that I call it analog year model and we already have NMME um, forecast um, available um, we use 99 um, ensemble members and we combine the PDF you get from the 
statistical model and the PDF we get from NMME, and we use an algorithm known as expert advice to uh, post-process them. And this is a method that uh, has been actually used in game theory, finance, gambling even, and some other fields, uh, but not in our field. This um, Lindin Cheng uh, developed, who is now working with uh, Balaji and uh, Marty, developed this as part of her uh, PhD dissertation. And I'll explain it in a minute. This is, this is a busy slide, but the idea is relatively simple. So the expert advice algorithm means that if you have an ensemble and a bunch of forecasts, the ensemble response, and I will explain it in a second, is basically predictions that is better than any given model plus an error term. And that error term is a function of the number of ensemble members. Basically, this EA algorithm or, or expert advice algorithm promotes the idea of ensemble response instead of ensemble mean or median or any other statistics of the ensemble. Uh, so in other words, it, it dynamically weights ensemble members and these weights change in time. And you can, um, for example, if you have models that perform better in dry seasons or wet seasons or better in certain part of the um, year uh, or under certain conditions, then it weights them accordingly um, over time. Um, and this is already published, in, the theory is already published in uh, Journal of Hydrology, but we haven't applied this. We have, we have just started applying it to drought prediction. Um, here is some um, uh, example predictions um, using this method I mentioned. So on the left, you have observations. Um, and I show you two examples. This is for, again, December, January, February um, observation on the left. And um, the corresponding NMME predictions, this is retrospective prediction using 99 ensemble members on the right. And if you look at, for example, the Western US and Southern US, you see that the signal, again, was opposite in prediction in the ensemble mean and observations. Um, if we apply just the expert advice algorithm that I mentioned on the NMME, so instead of taking the mean, taking the ensemble response, you see that the signal changes a lot and it gets a lot better. But when you combine it with the statistical model that I mentioned, uh, you get the one on the uh, lower right, and we call it a hybrid statistical dynamic uh, model simulation. So again, it relies on NMME as they are, um, but basically it looks into the historical prediction and it adjusts the weights in a way that models that are doing better get better weight, but still it includes everything, and you still have the whole ensemble memory, and you get the, your ensemble bound, um, with any confidence um, level that, that you want. So it shows um, um, basically some, some promise. And the next example is 2010. In the Western US, it was kind of wet as shown in the observations, but the uh, NME ensemble mean predicted dry, actually very dry, um, for two, 2010. Um, again, uh, if you just apply the uh, BA algorithm, I'm sorry, it's AE here, but it is actually BA. Um, again, it gets better, but when you combine it with the statistical model, it gets even better. Um, this is, again, the hybrid method that I mentioned. Again, it's not necessarily ideal, and I'm not suggesting that it's going to work from now on. It may not solve seasonal drought prediction problem, but it it seems to be quite promising, um, and um, we looked at the at the statistics of the entire Western U.S., um, the ensemble mean, and the hybrid method that I just mentioned. And here you can see December, Jan all December, January, February forecasts um, for the past um, 30 years or so, 1981 to 2010, and. Uh, on, and the color bar shows the percent, the diffraction of uh, negative anomaly captured by the ensemble mean on the left and the hybrid framework on the right. So um, again, this this to me is is exciting, uh, but still these are preliminary results. 
and um, we are in the process of um, looking into 2011 to um, 15 right now. Um, these results were generated just a couple of days ago. Uh, so very soon we should have the same results for the next couple of years. Um, we have had um, a major drought in the Western US. So um, hopefully in one of the uh, drought task force meetings um, in the next couple of weeks, we can also share the results for the next, for these past years. So um, this is what we're doing, and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, thanks a lot, Amir. Um, again, for those who are logged into the WebEx, use the hand raise feature or send me a chat message if you have a question. Any questions here in the room? Uh, Amir, can you clarify the lead time of the predictions you were showing? So all, and all the ones that I showed are December, January, February, so three months forecast. So how, much, how long in advance? I'm sorry? The lead time? I was wondering about the lead time of the prediction. So this is three months. So November looking into the next three months, December, January, February. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, Tim has a question for this one. Um, Tim, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Amir, um, in your algorithm for the weight, you mm -hmm. constrain the weights to sum to one. Um, did you have a, a parameter in there that you had to choose? Was that the gamma parameter, and how did you choose that? So, the uh, yeah, uh, that's a good question. So, um, in fact, one of the things we are doing right now, looking at the parameters and see what is the best way to come up with the gamma parameter and the weighting factors, because basically uh, there is an exponential function that determines the weight, and basically you can you can change your parameter and basically change the weights and put more more and more weights on the ones that are better, less and less to the ones that are farther. Basically, uh, that is a little bit subjective. So what what you're going to do? This requires a lot of uh, simulation. So we're going to run this with many different combinations of parameters and see what works best specifically for NMME ensembles and specifically for drought prediction. So um, again, these are preliminary results that requires a lot of try and error, a lot of parameter estimation analysis to come up with the best way to, um, to describe the weights. So that's still a work in progress. That's a very good question. I just have one comment. Uh, mm -hmm. Your algorithm looks pretty similar, I think, uh, to an algorithm that I've seen by Claire Monteleone at George Washington University, and she's a computer scientist, and she uses she has a method for choosing that that parameter. So you might that might be something of interest. Sure, I will definitely check it out. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question, Tim. Um, Amir, there was one question that was typed in, so I'll read this out to you. Um, this is from Karen McKinnon. She asked. You mentioned that a motivation for using the dynamical models was to capture the extremes that the, that the statistical model could not capture. Do mm -hmm. you generally find that the dynamical models do capture extremes? Well, one of the um, motivations, again, statistical models, you cannot really understand the cause of drought or understand the physics behind it. So they are dominated by initial conditions. When you have dynamic models, again, for example, if you have um, extreme temperature projected, and then basically your pr projected uh, pre precipitation will be consistent with your, um, let's say, simulated temperature and other variables. So that's why, no, not necessarily dynamic models are not necessarily great in predicting extremes, but a, a very, a, when, when you have a statistical model and you're dealing with an extreme that you've never observed, basically there's just no way that your model can catch it because it only relies on what it has already seen. But if you have a good dynamic model, there is some hope. Okay, thanks, Amir. And then, Marty, I don't know if you wanted to ask a question. Are you on the line there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Marty. Well, you know, we're good friends, Amir, so I can ask you this question and we'll still be good friends. <laughs> 
<laughs> sure. <laughs> I can't help but asking it, but this just seems too good to be true. Um, if it is true, you should patent it, and you'll be a millionaire in a matter of minutes. Um, mm -hmm. So, the, the, <laughs> so I guess we need to, you know, get a better. We don't have time to go into details, but I mean, the um, it, it looks wonderful. It looks too good to be true. Um, mm -hmm. What does what does CPC think about this? I mean, is this something that CPC is aware of that? with these methods that you're developing that they could do better than they've been doing? I mean, what are, what are we to take away from this experience that you're, the research that you're developing? With so CPC I on the line? Yeah, I presented this uh, in San Diego just a couple of days ago, and there were two people from CPC, and they showed interest. I have already shared my presentation with them. Um, and I agree, and uh, again, um, this is again preliminary results. It, may not be all that glorious if we do it for 2014, for example. Again, that's work in progress. I will update uh, you soon. Um, that's why I said, okay, that these are preliminary. We, you need to explore this even more and uh, make sure that this is robust and, uh, and works all the time. Um, but again, I, I, am, I am excited and uh, looks exciting, but it's too early to to say that we have really figured it out. <laughs> now, the people who were developing cold fusion weren't as careful as you are, so you know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it, it, seems, it seems almost, I mean, the, the, the variants that you're explaining, supposedly by the forecast that are independent from the verification period, you know, is, is almost beyond the variance you would explain by doing a specification of conditions that you do know it's that good. Right, one thing that I need to emphasize if you look at um, historical events, at any given a period of time, you find some dynamic models that do great. When you, but when you put a lot of them on top of each other, the signal is lost. Okay, and, uh, um, and basically, we can show this, and we are planning to look into that and identify models that work best. But the thing is, no single model is good at all times. Yep, I get it. So, so basically, what it does is what this algorithm just goes back in time and finds the best set for that particular period of time. And basically, that's it. And by bringing in, and you know, um, um, I'm sure you may have heard this from Dennis Ledermeyer, who says that it is really hard to beat a persistent based statistical model. That's pretty much true. Uh, by bringing that in, if the models are not really good and the statistical model is doing well, then the model will bias itself toward the statistical model. So here what you see is not 100% NMME or a subset of NMME. It's NMME and its statistical model. So you have still the full, P you have two full PDFs basically next to each other. So that also plays a role here. Now, if it's true, it's a billion-dollar figure. We'll see. Please <laughs> share it, please. Um, so, thanks for the question, Marty. Uh, I just, I mean, you're, I mean, we're getting a little late here, and I want to make sure we give John good time and don't get too late. But um, Hoog uh, Vanadul is on the line, and just wanted to make a comment. So, Hoog, if if you don't mind being um, as quick as possible with it, but we would like to hear from you. So, Hoog, are you there? Yeah, I'm up here. Well, we were asked whether CPC has an opinion. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you, Hoog. So, well, I'm, I mean, when, indeed, when it looks too good to be true, it usually isn't. And the, and the devil is in the details and so on and so forth. So, I mean, but you can never say never either. So, I mean, so I really don't know. I don't know this method in the, in the details, but there's a... Usually there is something wrong when it is too good to be true. That's that's a uh, fact of life. You cannot suddenly uh, change the basics of predictability to the point that you uh, approach perfection where none existed before. So it's it's a little hard to believe. So a billion dollars that 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 would be a good guess, but I uh, <laughs> it it looks too good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, I think it'll be a good topic for further discussion, especially in the drought task force con uh, context also, Amir. Um, and thanks for the presentation and stimulating all that discussion. It's great. Thank you.
Okay, so up next is um, John Nielsen Gammon. John, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Okay, great. And I'm transferring control over to uh, Brent's computer right now so that he can share his screen and slides. I don't know if Brent is still connected by audio. Oh, okay, there it goes. Save the best title for last. Yeah, so we, um, the title basically reflects the the idea that, uh, well, one aspect is that Texas droughts turn to endless floods, but uh, in, in particular here looking at um, how different indices and different tools represent uh, the end of a drought. Next slide. So here is uh, all the droughts since 1895, according to the Climate Division data, um, plotting the Palmer Drought Severity Index, um, the drought, the Timeline spans about seven years. The real long one is the drought of the 1950s. The thick black line is the uh, 2010 to 2015 drought. Uh, the Palmer Drought Index finally went positive in March. Um, but Texas is a big state, and characterizing the condition of drought throughout the state with one number is not really a good idea. So that's basically what motivated our project. Next. So what we want to do is get down to as fine a scale as possible with uh, drought monitoring. And there are four ingredients to this. First off, the stage four precipitation analyses that the river forecast centers produce, which gives us precipitation. You can do percent of normal, but you don't really know how unusual a particular percent of normal is. So you need to make a drought index out of that. And uh, you can do that using historical observations of a long enough time period to get the basic PDF or the statistical parameters that describe the PDF, but those are at point locations. Um, to fill in the uh, gap and give a, give a representative spatial analysis, we use the climate normals from the PRISM analysis, which is, is high resolution and presumably accurate in the normal sense. Uh, you may ask why we don't just use PRISM the whole way out, and that's because even though the in information is provided at high resolution, it's still constrained by the uh, spacing of the available gauges. So we use the normals from PRISM and the statistical parameters at higher moments from the co-op observations. And then to represent this, we started with the SPI, but have made a slight modification to that, which we think works a little bit better, which I'll describe in a moment. Next slide. Right now, we're um, in phase three. We developed a prototype in Texas. Then we got uh, funding from the USDA to partner with NC State and Purdue to take it um, quasi-nationally. And now we're um, in the process of refining the technique to um, make it uh, suitable as an operational project product and even uh, feed uh, land surface models with the high resolution information. Next. So um, I'm going to take you on a quick tour of the Texas drought using basically phase two quality drought index information from our project. Uh, we're using what we call the SPI blend, which is the SPI calculated not just for a single time period, say six months or three months, but actually for a range of time periods, which has some nice properties that I don't have time to get into here, but I can answer questions about it. And because there's a range of time periods involved and multiple different time periods can be defined, what we're going to show you here is the minimum value of the SPI blend um, from time periods that ranges from two months to two years. So you can think of this as the, the worst uh, level of drought, whether it's short term or long term. Next slide. So these are, of course, rooted in radar data, although they're gauge calibrated manually. Um, and uh, you, you see the, the colors in, in yellow and red correspond to the U.S. drought monitor categories. So we're converting the SPI to the percentiles for the U.S. drought monitor. The lowest 2% is exceptional dryness, lowest 5% extreme dryness, and so forth. And then at the other end of the PDF, uh, similar percentiles apply to unusually wet conditions. Um, next. 
So what we're going to look at here is the evolution of drought, which really started in October, but doesn't show up long enough time period until December. January was the only wet month in the entire first 12 months of the drought. And it was, uh, of course, uh, quite intense in the spring, and, and it only got worse during the summer. We tied the record for, with, with Oklahoma, we share it, for the hottest 12, hottest summer on record. Broke our record for the driest 12 months on record by a large margin. And at this point, it was pretty easy to characterize drought. It was exceptional just about everywhere. Go on. Now, as we look forward, we start seeing some improvements, and the drought monitor tool that we're developed here comes comes into its own, really, because you start seeing lots of spatial structure, and the different locations pick up rain and get see improvements. Um, we're transitioning here from shorter term to longer term drought, so changes don't happen very rapidly. But then we had a short dry period, like just crept in at the end of 2012, and pretty rapidly get um, exceptional dryness spreading on the short term, but that then can go away pretty quickly when it rains again. Next. So now we're uh, into the third year of the drought, and uh, it's now become rather patchy. Uh, the area in the Panhandle and a little bit down the Red River is one of the worst hard-hit places. The other place that's notable is Austin. You see that green patch um, sort of just to the lower right of the center of the map, uh, that's the Onion Creek flood, which um, produced uh, um, up to 10 inches of rainfall in a short period of time. But Austin's uh, water supply is from reservoirs that are located one to two counties to the west where conditions were still dry. So the, the, the local meteorological drought was different from the drought that people were experiencing at this point. Next. Um, and as time went on, really, agriculture did pretty well. Most of the issues were hydrologic, but drought had one more kick for the panhandle. You see an exceptionally dry springtime. Uh, fortunately, it's not the rainy season there. Rainy season is summer, and the very next week they got some nice precipitation, which got things going back on track. Uh, from here on out, it's mainly improvements. Uh, we're getting to the end of 2014, and uh, we basically have a wet month and a dry month, wet month and dry month. You see some parts of the state are exceptionally wet, while other parts are still exceptionally dry at this point. And now we're into May, which is what well, turns out to have been the wettest month ever in Texas by a two-inch margin. And uh, the even though we're looking at the lowest SPI value or the percentile equivalent, Majority of the state is actually on the plus side. Next frame. And uh, that continued to improve. Next. Next slide. And uh, finally, this last one shows the uh, current conditions where you're hard pressed to find any um, dry values except in the trans Pecos region where there's poor radar coverage. Um, that last little artifact there is an indication of why we still need to um, apply. Um, what we're, do, what we're doing from phase two to phase three to, to uh, eliminate the sort of lingering artifacts that basically show up strongly when you're taking a product that was designed to be looked at in a one-day snapshot and apply it over a two- to three-year accumulation. So the, the errors show up because you're beating down the signal-to-noise ratio for the bias. That means you then can identify those biases accurately and do something about them. Um, next slide. So you, you're seeing the evolution of the drought, and with the product we looked at, it sort of has the same arc as the statewide PDSI, very rapid degradation, and then gradual stop-start improvement. Next slide. But toward the end of the drought, the main impacts were with reservoir levels, and here you can see the history of reservoir levels in Texas. Uh, the black line on top is the conservation storage capacity. It indicated the start of the drought in late 2010. You can see it took a big dive in 2011, then almost recovered, and then was back low again. And when the PDSI went positive in March, the orange arrow shows that we were still at uh, very low levels compared to the norm. And uh, now we've, we've made up most of that difference. So all of that happened in the past uh, two or three months after the PDSI uh, index indicated the drought was already over. Next. And uh, 
just briefly highlight a few reservoirs that show that story. First off, Lake Arrowhead, the reservoir supply in Wichita Falls, um, went from uh, 20% of uh, capacity to over 100% in two-week period. Next slide. Um, Palo Pinto Reservoir, again, looking over the past year plus, it was declining. But in fact, they had less than six months of water remaining in the reservoir for the cities that were relying on it for water supply. Again, a couple of weeks and it's full. Next slide. And lastly, a lake farther south, Medina Lake, which um, has, has seen a, hasn't gotten full yet, but has seen a bigger in, in inflow in the past week when it hasn't rained than it had basically during the past year when it when it uh, uh, was still embedded in drought. Next slide. And uh, so um, the drought monitor still had drought in Texas in March because of the reservoir issues. But as you can see, with if you get historic rainfall amounts, you can fill up reservoirs pretty quickly. And so. In just two months, we've seen a five-category improvement in uh, parts of north central Texas from from exceptional drought to uh, not even any lingering dryness. Next slide. So what we're doing with our product right now is um, eliminating artifacts from a radar point of view, starting with the, the things that have particular structures because of how the radar works. In like beam, beam blockage, uh, range dependent biases, and mostly the element of those artifacts, we're going to find, apply a final um, analysis pass on gauge data using the using the corrected rate of data as first guess um, to get a high resolution product that is consistent with the gauge data to the extent that's practical, to the extent that the gauge data is accurate. Next slide. And so uh, we're we're about uh, two thirds of the way through that process. So the next step in the remainder of the project is validation and uh, testing this as a uh, four kilometer resolution input for NLDS2. So perhaps help take that down to a finer scale. Um, just leave up my contact information here at the end and uh, we'll see if there are any questions. Great. Thanks a lot, John. And thanks, Brent, for running the slides. So um, if there are any questions, again, on the line, please use the chat feature or use the raise hand feature, and I will unmute your line so you can ask John. Any questions here in the room for John? Okay, John, I'll just uh, wait a few seconds and see if anything pops up in WebEx. Hi, John. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the advantages of the SPI blend, the different uh, type of indices that you uh, described versus you know, the better known SPI type of approach? Sure. So, take for example, um, two month SPI would be basically a converted um, uh, estimate of the, the commonness or unusualness of precipitation that happened over the preceding two month period. But um, hydrologically and, and agriculturally and so forth, the rain, uh, all raindrops are not created equal. The rain that occurred in the past month, week has a bigger impact than the rain that occurred two months ago. So effectively, what our blending does by looking at a range of time scales, say uh, a blend might include one month, two months, and three months. Uh, accumulation totals all combined and then converted to an SPI. Uh, what that does is it effectively provides a higher weight to the more recent precipitation and a lower weight to the precipitation that was farther back. Um, as a result of that, you don't see the see large artificial jumps in SPI values as major precipitation events suddenly drop off the edge of the SPI interval. Instead, uh, we see the SPI changing gradually as events become farther and farther back in time. And that, that reflects what, what the soil and the, and the system is responding to as well. Uh, John, uh, Marty had a, um, a question here. He said, uh, he asked, is, the rapid, is this rapid recovery typical and linked to time of year? Well, let's see. We've, we only have historical drafts occasionally. Um, so there's really only a two or three 
two, three, or four event sample size to go on. Um, but um, we set the record, for example, for consecutive uh, two-month rainfall, April and May of this year, at the which ended this drought. The previous record was April and May of 1957, which ended the drought of the 1950s, which was the most severe drought on record. Um, also, um, the driest calendar year was back in 1917, and 1918 was dry also. And uh, in 1919, we had the third or fourth wettest two-month interval, although it was in the fall. So there is possibly something to do with the specific evolution of SST anomalies that, that leads to this particular sequence of events in this part of the United States. But uh, can't really address that with observations. It takes some modeling to tease that out. Okay, thanks, John. Marty, you have any follow-up? You don't want me to ask that other question, but I will. Hey, Amir, did you see this coming? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good enough answer. <laughs> Just teasing. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. Um, so, uh, John, thank you very much for the presentation. That was very interesting. Yeah, thank you, Brett. Okay, great. So uh, this is the end of the webinar, and I want to thank all four speakers for taking the time to present. I think this was a really, really interesting slate of presentations, um, and uh, and really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And thanks to the audience. We had a pretty large audience on the phone today. It looks like about 120 or so folks called in over the course of the webinar. And um, this is also the final webinar in this year's webinar MAP webinar series. So we'll take a break over the summer, and we'll come back in the fall. Um, we have four, I believe, four seasons now of this webinar series, and all of the recordings and um, slides are up on our website, so feel free to go back and take a look. Uh, we've explored quite a few topics over the last few years. We've had a few thousand people attend the webinar series, and um, we now have the videos up on YouTube, so it's very easy to stream. You don't have to download some weird um, stuff, uh, WebEx uh, software anymore to look at them, so that's a really great uh, development, and um, and I've really appreciated all of the talks over the course of this year, and I'm um, looking forward to next year's webinar series and hope people come back and join again. Thanks. <laughs>